welcome everybody. Um, I'm Vanessa Johnston. I'm an end of life doula here in Denver, Colorado, and I am the vice president of the nonprofit organization Colorado End of Life Collaborative. Uh, I'm honored today to be presenting this webinar with um, Bob Drake. He is from Compassion and Choices. Um, that is a national nonprofit organization. Uh, you may be familiar with them, but if not, um, their goal is working to improve patient rights and individual choice at the end of life. So today we're going to be talking about medical aid and dying, uh, particularly in Colorado, um, and what the process is to go through that. Um, it's more complicated than some people realize uh, in some areas. So, but we wanted to just get that knowledge out there. So um, I am, as I mentioned, the vice president of the Colorado End of Life Collaborative. Uh, on the call, we also have our president, Cindy Kaufman. She'll be monitoring the chat. So if any questions occur to you as we go through this um, presentation, please just put them in the chat and then she'll make note of them. And then we've left time for questions at the end. So um, this will be recorded uh, and available to everyone later on our YouTube channel for the Colorado End of Life Collaborative. Um, and what we are is a, a nonprofit organization of end of life professionals. So we um, have vetted our end of life doulas and other affiliates um, to make sure that we are a group of trusted uh, resources for people who are really looking um, for providers in end of life care. Um, we are about uh, empowering the individual as, as much as possible. And part of that means making sure that people are aware of the resources that are available to them. Um, so that's who we are, that's who I am. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our, our main speaker today. Um, I'm very honored to present uh, Bob Drake. He is a chaplain. Uh, he's also the chairman of the Healthcare Advisory Council with Compassion and Choices. Uh, he's their medical outreach manager. Uh, the Healthcare Advisory Council, I've been uh, privileged to sit in on a few meetings with them. It's an interdisciplinary group of healthcare professionals, and they are really advocating for patients uh, and to have access to end of life care like medical aid and dying. They were uh, instrumental in passing the law in Colorado in 2016, Proposition, um, I think it was, was it 106? <laughs> or 108, I can't remember, but it, it went into effect at the beginning of 2017, but still a lot of people don't understand what that procedure is. So we're hoping to demystify it here today, uh, to explain a little bit better, and then I'm going to let Bob take over and um, also his guest explain uh, who she is and why she's here, but we are just so thrilled to have you here today, so thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, everyone. Good to see you. I will make a quick distinction between the uh, National Healthcare Advisory Council and the Colorado Medical Provider Advocacy Group, um, and uh, that's Colorado specific that Vanessa is part of. Um, so, just uh, very little about myself. I am a hospice and palliative care chaplain, longtime healthcare. Uh, person, um, end of life educator, and uh, home funeral guy, et cetera. But my job is to educate the medical world on medical aid and dying, in particular uh, in those states or jurisdictions where the laws exist. Compassion Choices itself is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active uh, nonprofit organization um, dedicated to expanding quality equitable end of life care and medical aid in dying is, is one of the primary things that that we do. Um, the person that's joining me today is storyteller we call her Joanne Tubbs Kelly. Uh, she'll be presenting a little bit later about her experience with her husband Alan and his utilizing uh, medical aid in dying in, in January of 2020 and also very briefly too about her her new book. So let's move right in. I want to start with this quotation from Atul Gawande. And if you haven't read Being Mortal, I really would encourage you. He said, 
Life is meaningful because it is a story. And in stories, endings matter. As doulas, I know you appreciate that. It's become really complicated to die across the world, and in particular in the United States. Um, modern scientific cap capability has profoundly altered the course of human life. People live longer and better, uh, but these scientific advances can cause problems and turn the processes of aging and dying into a medical experience rather than a human experience. Of the, meta, the end of life options that uh, currently exist, and, and I know as doulas, you're all aware of these, we're gonna be talking about the last one, but for instance, when a patient comes to, a person comes to a physician, a physician in, in Colorado, um, and asks for a prescription for medical aid in dying, the law says the doctor must talk about these other options. That is to continue to pursue all life-sustaining treatment, to refuse treatments, to discontinue treatments, to enter hospice or, or a palliative care program, voluntary stopping of eating and drinking, with Vanette, which I think Vanessa will be talking about a little later, and, and we can certainly address that in the future. Um, to put the person into a state of deep sedation or a medically induced coma, and then, of course, medical aid in dying. Please let me know if I'm moving too quickly. So what is medical aid in dying? By definition, it is a medical practice in which a mentally capable, cognitively aware adult with prognosis of six months or less to live can request a physician's prescription for medication, which they then can choose to self-ingest for a peaceful end to their terminal suffering. And I will um, call out here this New Mexico, we just passed a law there where prescribers can be not just physicians, but also advanced practice nurses and uh, physician's assistants. But that's the definition, generally speaking. Everywhere in this country, where these laws ex exist to utilize the law, you must be an adult, you must be a resident and prove you're a resident, it's not, it's not difficult. You must have a, a terminal prognosis of six months or less to live. Notice that that is the same as with hospice for hospice enrollment. You must be able to understand this informed uh, position and this decision and the impact that it will have on you, namely that it will kill you. And you must be able to take the medications yourself. No one can, can they can help you um, mix the meds, et cetera. Doulas can do this too, by the way, that's the question that comes up often, but you must be able to ingest the meds yourself. So what is this really about? It's about, intolerable terminal suffering. The intolerable part is defined by the patient and only the patient. It is terminal and that is defined by the medical team. And the suffering itself is phenomenological. It is defined by the patient and the suffering can be physical, spiritual, it might be anxiety, it might be nausea, it might be just um, having lost what we call anhedonia, lost any ability to get joy in life. Medical aid in dying is currently authorized in 10 states plus the District of uh, Columbia. And by the way, the Colorado law was really interesting. It came about by ballot measure and it had the highest support of any ballot measure in Colorado history. And that's across the political spectrum. That's across the religious spectrum. Overall, I think it was, as I recall, it was something like 68% overall support. And things are changing. You notice on this slide uh, that the Colorado Medical Society is one of the groups of these disparate uh, medical type associations that uh, came out and said, okay, we will, we will um, maybe not actively support it, but we will do away with our, with our resistance to it. 
Let me know if I'm moving too quickly, okay? But I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for Joanne to talk about her experience with Alan. So what does this really look like? Um, it's broken down into the disparate components that, with the physician of which there will be two. And as I mentioned now in New Mexico and also with our model medical aid and dying law that we're uh, attempting to promulgate across the country. And by the way, we just uh, changed the California law as well, but, but we're trying to get advanced practice um, nurses and PAs to be able to prescribe, also social workers to uh, take care of the psychological component if that is necessary. The attending physician is the prescribing physician. This is the doc or provider that writes the prescription after they have evaluated the patient, done whatever documentation the law requires, told them about all the different um, options uh, aside from medical aid and dying, and also that they should involve family, that they should not do this in a public place. Um, and, then the, and then that physician or, or provider will refer to a second physician who will basically, um, the, the idea there is to collaborate, to make sure that the prescribing physician is, is correct in their assessment, that this person is terminally ill with a six month or less prognosis, that they understand what's going on, that they were not coerced in any way, and, and that they don't have any significant psychological uh, conditions that are happening. If they do have, if one of the physicians thinks the person is uh, um, maybe not just depressed, but inordinately depressed or is, um, psychologically incapable of understanding, then they will refer that out to the person out to a psychologist or in some cases, a clinical social worker. So the consulting doc will uh, evaluate the person, review all the med medical records, uh, confirm and document what's going on, and then refer out if necessary. And of course, the state forms are different in every state. Um, are the people that are on this call, are they, are you all primarily from Colorado then? Pretty much all. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. So most of this will extrapolate to other places, but so if, uh, if in, in Hawaii, it's a different kind of law and, um, there everyone is required to have a psychological or a psychiatric evaluation. Uh, we consider that a barrier uh, to access to this um, medicine, but that's the law. Um, the other people that may have a lot to do here is the pharmacist. Of course, this must be compounded. Uh, you, not every pharmacist can do this. They have to be a, a compounding uh, pharmacy. And and the pharmacist, the nurse, the social worker, the chaplain, and the doula can be part of this. And uh, in many cases, like um, the University of Colorado, uh, Denver Health, they have a, a navigator and, uh, you know, that is really useful. Kaiser Permanente has navigators to help people and the family walk through this. The nurse is a really important person in this. And the social worker, chaplain, and a blight doula may, be, may have very important parts as navigators in this process as well, which can be a pretty complex process. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The doula, importantly, you know, um, most people that utilize this law, if they want someone there, they want the people that they're close to, uh, they may want their hospice nurse, they may want a chaplain or doula or, or um, home funeral guide. Um, it's usually not the physician that they want there at the time of death. And many hospices have chosen to opt out and not allow their staff to be present at time of ingestion, not allow their physicians to prescribe or serve as consulting. But the end-of-life doula can have a, a variety of really important parts to play in this. So 
What's required, and this is true for all 11 jurisdictions, are two oral requests to the attending physician. That's a physician that knows this person well and understands their care. Separated, those uh, oral requests separated by 15 days. Now that is no longer the case in California. That is not the case in New Mexico. And that is no longer the case in Oregon. We have changed that law to um, reduce that 15 days to 48 hours. If the physician or provider believes the patient will not survive. And part of this is based on uh, studies by Kaiser Permanente and Sutter Healthcare, um, uh, City of Hope, National Medical Center. They found that about a third of the people that wanted these medications and wanted to have a peaceful end to their terminal suffering did not survive that 15 days. So it's a huge barrier. Uh, and then a request to the consulting physician and a written and witnessed uh, uh, request as well. And all of these go into the medical records. In every jurisdiction, no one can be forced to utilize this law. No one can be forced to participate. If you're a healthcare provider or organization, you cannot, you have no duty to participate nor is there any liability if you do participate. For, um, it, it, uh, there has never been a case when a physician or other professional has uh, been brought to court or even uh, cited in any way uh, for this. There is no liability. That's a really important part of what these laws are designed to do is remove liability so people can participate. So you can opt in or you can opt out. And there are, there are guidelines around that. Maybe we can talk about that in Q of A. Um, you cannot be coerced. Uh, if you utilize this, it does not affect your, any contract, any insurance uh, policy that you have in no way because it is legally not suicide. It's really important language here, and we will talk about that as well. Um, it is not suicide, it is not mercy killing, it is not euthanasia, it is not homicide. It is medical aid or physician aid in dying. And we will actually discuss the differences between suicide and, uh, and medical aid in dying. I thought you might find it interesting to see that all of these laws were essentially modeled after the Oregon Death with Dignity Law. And that includes Colorado's law. So up and through 2020, about 2,900 people uh, took, got written prescriptions. And of those, about two thirds actually took the medication. And we find this to be true across every jurisdiction. It tends to be about a third of people end up not taking the meds. They die sooner. They just decide not to take it. Uh, they lose capacity, either physical or mental capacity. And, and are therefore not qualified to utilize the law. Um, uh, most of these people, 93% have died at home. The hospice, one of the things that happens when these laws come into play is that there's a huge increase in, in not just conversations about death and dying and what is a good death, but also in interest in hospice and palliative care. And the primary reasons that people have cite for uh, using medical aid and dying is that they no longer have the autonomy, the ability to do uh, what they want. And, uh, and, and hedonia, they have lost the ability to enjoy life. In Colorado, um, the uh, the, the, the latest data that we have is 2020, uh, 188 people uh, were prescribed the medications, about two thirds of those again actually took the meds. Uh, they were prescribed by about 70 different physicians. The med median age of the person is, was 73. There's a big spread in that. Most of the people that are primary diagnosis was some form of cancer or some neurological disorder like ALS. 
MS, Parkinson's, uh, COPD. And as you can see here, almost 89% of the people in Colorado in this time were involved in hospice. And you know um, what a blessing that is, hospice is. Forgive me for a second. What we find is that the top reasons people cite are loss of autonomy, loss of dignity, diminished quality of life, and last, fear of pain and suffering. It's interesting that that is not that people think that, that the reason people do this is because of fear and pain and suffering, but that is not the most cited. Um, it's really more about the, the entire gestalt, the, entire, the entirety of what the person's quality of life is. And I, I can refer you and give you information later on this from the Journal of Medical Ethics that con concluded that there's no evidence of any heightened risk for the elderly, for women, for the uninsured, for people of low educational or economic status, um, the physically disabled, people with psychiatric illnesses. I cite this because every time we bring a law up, um, these, are the, these are the arguments that are put out there. And in fact, in almost 50 years of combined experience, there has never been one case of documented abuse or coercion. The medications we'll talk about briefly. I won't go into this uh, too much, I, would, I you do see that I have a citation here, ACA made, the American Clinicians Academy on Medical Aid and Dying. They do offer some really great resources and education, um, some of the most up-to-date information on the pharmacology, and um, it's a good resource. We also offer end-of-life counselors so people from across the country can call and they and their families uh, can talk about this process or about VSED or whatever else might be in play. We have a doctor doc line medical directors that will talk to physicians and pharmacists across the country. But the meds will vary a little bit. Um, but in, in essence, they're all self-administered. Usually the person falls asleep in 15 to 20 minutes and um, ultimately will go into a coma and die within about two hours. The medications have been changed to bring the time to death down. <clears throat> and of course, to make it um, peaceful. Most commonly now, uh, what's used is D-DMA, um, which, which includes the uh, Anti-emetics, the anti-nausea drugs taken first, and then about 30 minutes before the rest of the cocktail taken to Joxin, which is a heart med, um, and then uh, diazepam, morphine, as you know, and, and amitriptyline. And we won't go into that uh, much further than that. But I thought you'd find it interesting to see what, what the meds are. So as I mentioned, um, this will not uh, alter or Im impinge on either health or uh, life insurance. And as far as paying for it, many private health insurance policies will pay for this. Anything associated with the US government will not. So if you're in Medicare, Medicare will not pay for it. The VA will not pay for it. Um, many states have carve outs with I don't know if you have heard of B.J. Miller, Dr. Miller, who started and directed the Zen Hospice in San Francisco. Um, it tells my internet connection is unstable. So let me know if somehow if I if I get unstable, more unstable than I usually am. Um, <laughs> B.J. says in end of life care, there is no place for language that causes fear, anxiety, guilt, or shame. And I, I bring this out because um, the use of the word suicide is, is disrespectful. It's not legally accurate. And I'll give you some proof sources from suicide professionals who say this is just not the same. 
The other reason I wanted to call this out is that it's very often the case, especially with hospice practitioners, staff, they'll come into the patient, patient's house, patient's already decided, and believe me, this is not a quick decision. They have worked it out, and they have worked it out in their families. They have worked it out spiritually. They know what they're doing. They want to live, of course, but they want to choose how they die and reduce their intolerable suffering. And so what doesn't work is for a hospice person to show up, you know, each time they come and say, are you sure you want to do this? Please don't do that. <clears throat> it is not suicide. <clears throat> the American Psychological Association says medical aid in dying and suicide have profound psychological differences. The American Association of Suicidology says you should not use this language of suicide. They are not the same. This slide shows some of the differences between medical aid and dying and suicide. In made medical aid and dying, there is always, by definition, a terminal diagnosis. We both know, we all know that that may not be the case when someone uh, takes their own life. Uh, mental capacity is always there by definition. And we have two physicians and the hospice team all agreeing that they are they have capacity, they have a terminal diagnosis. And and Joanne, I know will speak to this. Alan did not want to die. They want to live. And that's not the case when someone chooses to, to uh, end their life through suicide. It's planned, it's collaborative with family and friends, people, you choose who you want to have there. It's a gentle, overall, a gentle, calm death. Um, and we're finding that the grieving process is for the family, the survivors, is incomparably different than when someone takes their own life, which usually is by a violent method. So the grief is quote unquote normal, if there is such a thing. By the way, you have a social worker in, Col in Colorado who is also part of the, our medical advice, uh, provider advocacy group, Jen Curran, a uh, PhD social worker who's got an IRB, IRB study working specifically to study grief in the families following medical aid and dying. The death certificate will show the diagnosis, the terminal diagnosis. It will not say medical aid and dying. It will not say physician aid and dying. How are we doing on time? I think we're okay. So it'll say COPD, kidney failure, <clears throat> whatever like that. We find that just having a prescription is palliative. Just having a, a prescription provides um, peace of mind, peace of heart, whether or not they choose to ultimately you use that med, those meds. Um, we've talked about this and uh, there's no evidence again of any coercion or abuse. Oregon, since 1994, fewer people have died with intolerable terminal suffering. It has not increased the number of people that have died. That makes sense. That's a beautiful picture of Crater Lake, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Greater utilization of hospice and palliative care. People are, are able to die at home, choose the place where they die and with whom but there are barriers and their, their barriers are complex. We need patient and family understanding, physicians who will prescribe and consult. We need hospices that will participate and get educated. And if they choose not to participate to uh, refer them out, and this is the case with physicians as well, the New, New Mexico law requires hospices and health systems to post on their website 
what their policy is on medical aid in dying and requires them to refer out and transfer medical records. So the patient doesn't have to start over. Pharmacies need to be able to need to participate and compound. This is a slide put together by our uh, national medical director, Dr. David Grew, of uh, the uh, health system in Corvallis, Oregon, small, relatively small town. Uh, to this, I, we won't go through this um, piece by piece, but you can see this is not necessarily an easy process, and it is not a quick process. So to summarize. Um, it is uh, contrary to what many palliative care physicians are afraid of. For instance, it is not a failure of palliative care. It is not a failure of hospice care. Uh, I know as a hospice chaplain that we can manage uh, symptoms in, of most deaths, most. But the symptoms may be complex, nausea, you know, um, pain, convulsions, uh, anxiety, and that's not to mention the, the dignity aspect, the autonomy, the, the suffering that can happen there. Um, but we, some deaths are just not, A, not what we want, or B, not comfortable. Um, just having these conversations helps uh, the patient. And it's person-centered as opposed to physician-centered. And I would say when we look to our sources of education, I would caution you to look for sources that hold this as what's most important is the physician or is the, the person, the patient and the family, not that it be a medical procedure, not that a physician be required to be there, for instance. And language is important. So a few takeaways, I think we're doing okay on time. Wonderful. Death is not the enemy. It is intolerable terminal suffering. And two things matter really at the end of the day here, comfort and respect. And there is always room for more kindness. So let's see here. I'm going to read just uh, another quote by Atul Gwande, Dr. Gwande. A few conclusions become clear when we understand this, that our most cruel failure in how we treat the dying is the failure to recognize that they have priorities beyond being merely safe and living longer, that the chance to shape one's story right up to the end is essential to sustaining meaning in life and that we have the opportunity to refashion our institutions, our culture, and our conversations in ways that transform the possibilities for the last final chapters of life. And so now I would like to introduce Joanne. Um, Joanne uh, Kelly, Tubbs Kelly, graduated from Empire State College, part of the New York New York State University system with a degree in fine art. She spent most of her career working as a freelance writer, producing marketing materials for high-tech companies. She moved to Colorado in 1985, settled in Boulder where she still lives. And in addition to serving on other boards, she was president of the board of directors for Colorado's chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. She also co-founded a nonprofit organization called Interfaith Network on Mental Illness, which aims to educate faith communities, encourage them to welcome and embrace their congregants who struggle with mental health challenges. In her free time, she loves to putter in her garden and hike and drink in the beauty of Colorado. Uh, this is a picture of Joanne and her husband, Alan, and a picture of the cover of her book, Walking Him Home, Helping My Husband Die with Dignity. Joanne, will you tell us your story with Alan? Thank you, Bob. And thank you um, to all of you for inviting me today. 
Um, I just want to warn you that my book is not yet available. It's being published by She Writes Press in um, August of 2022. So it's coming soon to a bookstore near you. Um, I am going to read you a very, very short passage from my book. But first, I'd like to just share a little bit about Alan's death and his decision to use medical aid in dying. Alan and I were married in 1997 when we were both in our late 40s. He was the man of my dreams. He was kind and funny and good looking, and he had a million friends. He was known for his wit and he loved to make people smile and laugh. If I had to speculate about his mission here in the world, I would say that it was to bring a little light into the lives of everybody he touched. When Alan was in his early 60s, he started having these weird violent dreams and acting them out when he was sound asleep. This sleep disorder was the first clue we had that something strange was happening in Alan's brain. By 2015, other symptoms started emerging. So he would get really lightheaded when he stood up and sometimes to the point of passing out. And his bladder stopped working completely. Um, so Alan started seeing a neurologist who was a movement disorder specialist at Kaiser. It took the doctors more than two decades, or two years, I'm sorry, to rule out all the other possibilities and decide that Alan had an illness called multiple system atrophy, or MSA, which is a fatal neurodegenerative disease. Most people who have MSA live from three to five years after diagnosis, but Alan was going downhill really quickly. He went from walking with a little help from a cane to being full-time in a power wheelchair in 16 months. Alan had always said, even before we suspected that he was sick, that we treat our pets better than we treat our elders because we help them die when their lives become painful and miserable. So Alan was overjoyed when Colorado voters passed the End of Life Options Act in 2016. And I was not the least bit surprised when he started talking about using the provisions of this law for himself. In early 2019, he asked me to make an appointment for him with the Kaiser Palliative Care team so we could start the discussion about medical aid and dying. He knew he didn't qualify yet at that point, but he wanted to be ready when the time came. So we met with the team and they explained the criteria that Bob has already gone through. Alan had already let his daughters and all of his medical providers know that he didn't want to suffer indefinitely. To lie around in pain, unable to move or take care of his own body or unable to feed himself or even to move or swallow, this sounded like hell to Alan. But the worst part for him was not being able to talk clearly enough for people to understand him, to not be able to make people smile or laugh or to tell a little joke or ask people about their lives. And because of his illness, he talked like someone who was falling down drunk. So Alan had a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. So his plan A was to get his treating doctors at Kaiser to approve his request for medical aid in dying when he was dying. And if that failed, his plan B was to contact a physician at the University of Colorado Hospital who conducted a study on palliative care for people with MSA. Because in, so, and we participated in that study. And during our discussions with that doctor, we learned that he had approved um, applications for medical aid and dying for some of his MSA patients. And if that failed, Alan's plan C was to refuse to be treated with antibiotics the next time he came down with a urinary tract infection. One time when he was being treated for sepsis at the hospital, um, a compassionate nurse had shared with him that that was a peaceful way to die. So that was his plan C. In August of 2019, Alan's neurologist referred him to hospice. One of the criteria, of course, for hospice, as Bob has already said, is um, a life expectancy of six months or less. So Alan realized that once he cleared that bar, he'd met the first criteria for medical aid and dying. Um, but at that time, it was a really hectic time for us because 
I couldn't transfer Alan anymore. His legs were like noodles and it was really hard getting him from his wheelchair to the toilet or from his wheelchair to his bed. And so we were working on finding a nursing home for him. So Alan had his meeting with the Kaiser palliative care team to apply for MAID at the end of the first week in October of 2019. And the in and the in person after the in person interview, we completed the rest of the steps in the process. And at the end of October, Alan got a letter saying his application was approved. He was so relieved. It gave him great peace of mind to know that he could choose to end his suffering when he was ready. On the other hand, I was stunned. There was a part of my brain that just believed his application would be de denied. So I vowed then and there to make sure he was as comfortable and as happy as I could make him. So he would, wouldn't choose to die any sooner than necessary. He was at the nursing home for almost three months when he decided he was ready to die. So we started working on a plan. By then it was December and I, I asked him to wait until after the holidays so his daughters and granddaughters and I wouldn't be mourning him every Christmas for the rest of our lives. So he agreed to wait until January and we picked a date when everybody he wanted to be there could come, which was January 11th, 2020. So Alan shared the news one-on-one -on -one with close friends. And then we held a gathering at the nursing home three days before his planned um, death date. So friends and neighbors and people from church could come and say goodbye. Alan was clear he didn't wanna die at the nursing home. He wanted to be at home, in his own room, surrounded by people who loved him. So I worked hard to make that happen. We had a great hospice organization and they provided an ambulance to bring Alan home the morning of January 11th. I wanna tell you a little bit about the people who joined us for Alan's dying. His daughters, Alexis and Megan were there and his two oldest granddaughters, Caitlin, who was 15 and Olivia, who was 12 and a half. In addition to these family members, we had um, four other people. We had um, Beverly, who was our housemate. She lived in, a, we have an apartment in the downstairs of our house. And um, she was a retired nurse and she lived there and helped me take care of Alan. And I had talked her into being the person who takes care of all the drugs um, to have for Alan's death because I had participated in a friend's death by medical aid and dying a year earlier. And her husband had spent um, hours of her last day running around dealing with medication issues. And I, was, I did not want to do that. I wanted to be at Alan's bedside holding his hand the whole time. So in addition to Beverly, we had two close friends. There was Andy, who was the best man at our wedding, 20 some odd years, 22 years earlier, and his wife, Linda. And um, I, I just wanted to, um, I want you to know that they were not there to participate so much in Alan's passing, but they were our support team. They were the ones who made sure we stayed fed and we stayed hydrated. And um, if we had needed somebody to run to the drugstore or give hugs or whatever, that was their job. And they understood that and they felt very honored to be asked to do that. And then there was Scott, who was our minister um, and a close family friend. So this, this was the team that we had assembled to help us send off Alan. So Scott led us in prayer and then we held hands around Alan's bed and took turns thanking him for his many gifts and blessing him on this journey. Then the family members each spent a few minutes alone with him. So here's the short section from my, my memoir that I wanted to share with you. It starts with Beverly mixing up the prescription powder with apple juice. When the lumps were tamed, Beverly brought the mug of poison into Alan's room and held it out to him, a reluctant offering. Alan released his grip on my hand and accepted the mug holding it reverently with both hands. He hesitated only long enough to look me in the eyes and then lifted the mug in the direction of his mouth. Beverly stepped back and we all held our breath as we watched Alan take the first gulp through the fat straw. 
Beverly was the only person in the room who was not surprised when Alan spat out the straw. She already knew that the cocktail tasted disgusting. Bitter and metallic were the words she used to describe it when she told me the next day about tasting the concoction. She actually tasted it. Ugh. She also confessed how much she regretted skipping the optional step of adding stevia to the mixture. After Alan spit out the straw, I reminded him he had only two minutes to drink the rest of it or it would solidify. He held the mug to his mouth once more and drank through the wide bore straw until the mug was empty, closing his eyes and grimacing, but consuming every last drop. From that point forward, my eyes did not leave his face. Beverly brought him a glass of plain apple juice as a chaser to wash away the vile taste. She offered to bring him a shot of tequila, but he shook his head. All he wanted was a little morphine to take that immediate edge off his pain. Using a syringe, Beverly squirted the liquid under his tongue, and it wasn't long before the creases in his forehead softened and his jaw muscle, muscles relaxed. Time was fluid, but my guess was that it took Alan about 20 minutes before he started to fall asleep. He, he was already starting to nod off when his eyes fluttered open and he looked directly at me. I love you, I whispered, my eyes riveted to his. I love you, Alan whispered back. Andy, who was standing in the doorway at that moment, witnessed Alan's final words, our last exchange, and wept. He had witnessed our vows on our wedding day. And now he was witnessing our final affirmations of our devotion. We had loved each other unceasingly, sometimes fiercely, sometimes tenderly, until death intervened. He did not open his eyes again. Leaning forward on my stool, I continued to stroke Alan's forehead gently, lovingly, for a long time. Despite the fact that Alan appeared to be sleeping, perhaps he had slipped into a coma by then, he did not loosen his grip on my hand. We didn't know how long it would take Alan to die. The timeline prepared by Kaiser said it would take anywhere from eight minutes to 30 hours after he drank the cocktail. The late afternoon light from the window behind his bed splashed painterly highlights on his forehead, his nose. I wanted to take one last photo of him while he was still alive, but somehow it seemed sacrilegious and I couldn't let go of his hand to grab my phone for a photo. I couldn't let go of his hand for any reason. What I'm hoping you'll take away from this story is that medical aid in dying can be a tender and sweet way for a person to die. I miss Alan every day and I'm sorry he's no longer here, but I am deeply grateful that he was able to die the loving death he had envisioned for himself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joanne. I'm going to share my screen again. We get uh, another look at Joanne and Alan. <clears throat> that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move forward here and we're very close to q and I wanna just share a couple things with you. Uh, some resources that uh, we have I would really encourage you. We have uh, lots of training videos, things through nine that we did with City of Hope National Medical Center. Uh, we've got all kinds of, of training resources and uh, end of life resources. Um, the dementia pre pre provision for um, advanced directives. And I want to share one other thing here. This is... Uh, something coming up that I felt you would be interested in uh, with City of Hope. We're doing a symposium in Las Vegas, uh, in person and virtual, December 16 through 18. And uh, it's a really amazing, I'll just show you very quickly here, um, the program itself, everything from prognostication to um, delivering end-of-life news, 
geriatric and pediatric end of life, home funerals, grief and bereavement, spiritual care, uh, the place of the death doula, Francesca Arnoldi, who, who started and runs the University of Vermont program, and workshops on medical aid and dying, on communication, end of life, and advanced uh, care planning. So I'm going to just get back here. And I would encourage you to ask yourselves then, with respect to medical aid and dying, what is my role? Do I want to be involved? If so, how, to what degree? And why would I or want to or not want to participate in this? Um, what do I do if someone asks me about it? Someone I'm working with. And finally, before we move to Q&A, our old friend, Louis Pasteur. I always cry when I, when I read this. Um, he said, one does not ask of one who suffers, what is your country? What is your religion? One merely says, you suffer. This is enough. You belong to me. And I shall help you. I'm going to end my screen share. Also, don't worry about my emotions. I'm a, I'm a chaplain. I'm very comfortable with that. So I'm going to end my screen share here. And let's move to Q&A questions for either of us. Thank you. I received a couple of questions, um, one in the chat and one to me personally. So I'm just going to um, ask those of you. Um, Harriet asked if there was any way to get a copy of the slide presentation for today. I can send a, uh, not a PowerPoint, but a, 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 a version of it to you. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you for that. And we'll send that out. Um, uh, to anybody who would ask for that. So, and then there was a question from Robert Letterer. He says, if a person is covered by Medicare Advantage plan like Kaiser, who would pay for the medications? So if Medicare does not cover this because they're federal, uh, most, you know, 65 and over on Medicare. So do you have a yeah. answer for Robert? Yeah, so this goes back to the suicide uh, uh, funding Restriction Act, net federal law in 1997, that we're actually working to overturn. Um, Joanne, how did it work for you with Kaiser? Kaiser actually paid for all the visits that we had with the various doctors as we went through the steps, but we had to pay for the medication, but um, it was only a couple hundred dollars. It was not horribly prohibitively expensive. Thank you. And um, yeah, so this is one of the, the challenges that hospices have in, in providing this care is because they can't bill Medicare for it. And hospice is primarily funded by Medicare. Normally, nowadays, um, the cocktail costs between five and $650. And um, yeah, Great question. Okay, so Vanessa says, what if there is a barrier to access from the doctor or the hospice? What do you suggest? Can anyone go to the Denver Health Maid Clinic? Uh, I think anyone can go to the, the, the Denver system, um, but you would be, your care would need to be transferred. And so the first thing that, that I encourage people to do when I'm doing a public presentation is to say, go find out now whether your doctor will support you in this should you ever get to this point where you would like to utilize it. Find out now. If your physician hedges on it, he or she is probably not gonna support you in it. Um, that said, uh, it, it takes a while for physicians often to come around and very often they will come around. So ask your insurance company, will they pay or what will they pay for it? Ask your doctor, will she support this? Will she serve, if not the, as the attending prescribing, will she serve as the consulting physician? 
and then ask for a referral if not. And if you have trouble there, call us, call our end of life consultants or look for the through the portal at ACA Made. There aren't lists of physicians that do this. We don't, we don't keep lists for some very important reasons. Good question. It's like we've got about five minutes left. Anybody I just have a question? Well, I just want to speak up and say I did call the hotline um, for somebody and it was very informative. I spoke to a woman, Jenna, for probably 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the situation was just there was a woman in Boulder, Colorado, actually, who had been told that she was ineligible and she had ALS and she was on hospice. And so I said, well, no, I'm pretty sure she's eligible. And she was going to go through with VSED, which I know is not the easy way to go if you have the option of MAID, which is what she wanted. And so we were, we were able to get that for her and she was able to do that and so that was this past friday that that just happened and so it's just the education on this is so huge because even for me i needed to learn okay so if all that she can do is use her eyes she can't bring the cup to her mouth necessarily but she can drink through a straw and that's what you have to do and you just have to be able to accept it into your mouth and be able to drink um, the poison or the mixture, um, and four ounces, I think in two minutes or something like that, but it took about three hours and she was able to die how she wanted peacefully surrounded by her family. So thank you for what you do, everybody in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm in Wyoming and I really am going to try to get this past here. I'm a donor. I'm a volunteer. I'm an end of life doula and I'm, I'm trying, but yeah, it's Wyoming's a very, interesting state. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, Jenna is amazing. She is a longtime social worker. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 Let's, let's, uh, let's talk further about Wyoming. Thank you. Uh, this is Bob Letter. I have another question. Um, do you keep track or do you have any idea how many people have used the voluntary not or stopping eating and drinking? Um, you know, by law, those are, it's, it's not like um, medical aid and dying where there are prescriptions about what must be recorded. Right. So with V said, it's, it's different. Um, and so I, I'm not aware of any um, data like that. But feel free to uh, email me, rdrake at compassionchoices.org, and uh, I can hook you up with uh, further education on VSED webinars and ethicists, et cetera. And I believe that Vanessa wants to talk a little bit about VSED and training too. Vanessa, this might be a good time uh, to go to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to briefly talk about it. I think, I think what we're um, feeling is that maybe we'll do another one of these just on VSET alone, but just because we get so many inquiries about it. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, it's an acronym VSED. Uh, stands for Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking, um, and that is legal in all 50 states. So unlike medical aid and dying, which is, as Bob mentioned, uh, in 11 jurisdictions, this is legal everywhere. So, um, you know, for, for those who are in states where, where medical aid and dying is not legal, this is an option for them. Um, and, you know, a person may choose to control their own dying by making a conscious decision to refuse foods and fluids of any kind, uh, including artificial nutrition or hydration. Um, so that's what it's about. And it's a, a choice by decisionally capable adults who have the physical ability to eat and drink, but consciously refuse those foods and fluids in order to advance the time of their death. So they're consciously 
hastening their death. And, you know, it's about this um, uh, suffering that, that Bob was talking about earlier. That's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, and the Supreme Court has affirmed the right of a mentally capable individual to refuse medical therapies, including foods and fluids. So, so you know, that is our legal right. Um, but now the process looks different um, for each person uh, as far as how long it takes um, and, and that. Now, I will say just in general, it's a really good idea to have lots and lots of support uh, yeah. in emotionally, um, medically, just make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as that goes. Um, and, but it, it takes, uh, there's a variety of timelines for that. So, um, you know, there, it is protected by law. It is a right that everybody can have. Um, you should have a lot of support in place for that. But I think we're gonna leave the, the details of, of how you go through that process for another time because we're uh, maybe gonna do another one with Bob. Um, there is um, a website that's really, really good. Um, Cindy, maybe you can put it in the chat. And it's a nonprofit organization out of uh, Oregon, I believe. It's uh, uh, vsaidresourcesnorthwest.com. Uh, and you can go there and they have um, as much information as you would want as far as uh, what it looks like, uh, the process of it. Uh, what kind of support you would need, and um, just a wealth of information and people's stories there uh, to kind of help you through that process. Um, I really want to thank Joanne for being here today because that is just, it's so helpful to hear what the journey looks like um, as you come to these end of life decisions, you know, and, and to hear the path that you walked. Um, and and with Alan and just um, you know it's such an honor to be able to hear your story and learn from it and that we can spread that information to other people uh, and so that we can help decrease the suffering that that Bob was talking about. Um, so yeah, I'd really just like to uh, extend my thanks uh, to Joanne for being here and sharing her story and to you, Bob, uh, for sharing your expertise. Uh, this is something that we get a lot of questions about. And, um, you know, I, I think it's telling that this uh, measure passed with such enormous support uh, in 2016 in Colorado. Um, I, I think there's some momentum behind it in, in other states. Um, you know, that are coming on board. I'm really excited about the New Mexico law and how progressive that is um, and, and that there are improvements still to be made. So um, if there's any other questions, now would be the time um, if you have one for, for Joanne or for Bob, um, because I think uh, on the collaborative end, we're, we're gonna just hold it here uh, and maybe address uh, VSED questions in the future, just because I believe it, it um, uh, you know, it's entitled to its own sort of thing. It's, it's a different procedure, it's a different process. But the important thing is that it, to know right now is that it is a legal option if medical aid and dying is not legal in your state. So I don't know how many of you on here are from different states. So I just wanted to put that out there. So Cindy, do you have anything else from the chat to share? Well, let's see. So Kim shared that there is also a brand new book written by some of the true experts in the national field, Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking, a Compassionate widely available option for hastening death by Timothy E. Quill and three more, Oxford Press. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, that's a great resource, Tim Quill and everything he does. Wonderful. And Liz just shared education all around is so important. Thank you all for sharing. Um, yes, Liz, and thank you so much for sharing your story with your, your recent client as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully we can get Wyoming on board pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She wasn't a client of mine. She was just a friend of a friend. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Did you say this would be recorded? Yes, this is being recorded. Thank you. And so um, it'll take a little bit for our uh, 
uh, our tech person to clean it up and dress it up. And then we'll put it on our YouTube channel, but we'll also send it out to everyone. We'll send a notice out to everyone who registered where they can go and find the recording once we get it put up. And then feel free to share that link with friends and others who, who might benefit from this information that we've had here today if they couldn't join us. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you all so for much. All you. You Thank are you all so for participating. Welcome. Thank you all. Take care, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks for Thank joining you. us.